Hi class, today we're going to be talking about interaction and its social structure. In looking at interaction and social structure, sociologists have developed five different levels or perspectives to explain microsociology interaction. They include defining the situation by W.I. Thomas, symbolic interaction theory by George Herbert Mead, the dramaturgical approach by Irvin Goffman, ethnomethodology by Harold Garfinkel, and social exchange theory by Peter Bloch and George Homans. In defining the situation by W.I. Thomas, Thomas argues that how a person defines or perceives a situation is very important. And your reaction or your action in that situation comes about based on how you've defined it. So you walk into a classroom and you see an African-American professor. In your mind, African-Americans are inferior. So because you think African-Americans are inferior, it doesn't matter what that professor does. You still think that um, they're inferior. They could have been the best professor you've ever had. But it doesn't matter because in your mind, you've already predisposed yourself to believe in that no matter what this person does, this person is inferior. And if you think about it, the way we go about our lives, we perceive some things and, and you've heard the concept of don't judge a book by its cover. And that's the essence of what W.I. Thomas is talking about, that we, we, we have preconceptions and our actions are predicated upon our preconceptions. Now, George Herbert Mead looks at the concept of symbolic interaction. In looking at the concept of symbolic interaction, Mead argues that um, interaction as we know it is based on the concept of symbolism. What does he mean by that? So I walk into a room and I meet someone for the first time. I want that person to shake my hand. Am I going to say to that person, hi, please shake my hand? No, I'm not going to do that. So what am I going to do? I am going to outstretch my arm first. And the person recognizing that I've outstretched my arm will outstretch theirs. And so I will get that handshake that I want. However, if I never outstretch my arm, that person won't know that I'm expecting a handshake. And so I outstretch my arm and then they're able to recognize that, oh, I want a handshake. So again, when you take a look at George Herbert Mead, he again argues that our actions are very symbolic. And in essence, what you want from, what you expect from others, you give it and then you get it. Now we move on to the dramaturgical approach by Irvin Goffman. Now Irvin Goffman is a sociologist who studied under George Herbert Mead. What does that mean? It means that he took some of Mead's concept and he built on it. So according to Goffman, life is like a stage. And when you think of a stage, you think of directors and actors. However, according to Mead, on this stage of life, we are the actors and we are our own directors. So we write the script and we play the script. In other words, whatever it is that you want others to think of you, that's how you act and that's how they'll think of you. So if you want people to think that you're smart, then you act smart. You might not necessarily be smart, but you act smart. And folks will automatically assume that you're smart. Um, I remember when I was growing up in elementary school, I was afraid of being called on in class. But I developed a strategy and my strategy was very simple. Whenever the teacher asked a question, I was the first to put my hand up. Why? Because I believe that if I put my hand up, the teacher won't call on me because she'll know that I, she'll believe that I know the answer. And, um, most of the times, I did not know the answer. 
But because I put my hand up, she believed that I knew. He or she believed that I knew. And and so Goffman says that life is a stage and whatever it is you want to, to, to others to see, however you want others to see you as, that is how you behave. That is how you um, portray yourself. And um, he has something he calls impression management. Under impression management, you, you, you carefully, carefully construct um, your demeanor to... To, you construct your demeanor um, to control how others think of you. With impression management, there's on stage and backstage. On stage is what you do in in public, public, and backstage is what you may do in in your own in your own space. Um, then we have ethnomethodology by Harold Garfinkel. Harold Garfinkel is more of a practical person, right? So he says, you know what? We, 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 when we make decisions, we make decisions based on practical reasoning. We ask, why am I doing this? So you go to a family gathering and um, you had a rough day. At the family gathering, are you showing your facial expression that you had a rough day? No. You're being happy like everybody else. Why are you being happy? Because you're asking yourself the question, if folks see me with this rough face, they're going to think that they did me something. I don't want them to think that they did me anything. I don't want to offend anybody. So I go in and I'm happy. I go in and I'm all smiles. But deep down, I may be hurting because I had a rough day. And so, because I don't want to wear the rough day on my face, I show up with a smile. Finally, we have social exchange theory and Peter, so the social exchange theory by Peter Bloor and George Homans. Now, this theory is very interesting, right? So, they argue that behavior is premeditated and reciprocal in nature. In other words, I only do because I expect to get in return. I open the door for you because I expect to thank you. And then if you don't give it to me, I'm upset. I give you my seat on the bus because I expect you to show gratitude that I gave you my seat on the bus. You don't, and I'm upset. We send our kids to the best schools. We make sure that they have all the best things that we can afford. Why? Because we expect something in return. We're investing in them so that when we get old or older, they can in turn invest in us. Um, when we think of um, of interaction, we also think of of a social structure. In looking at social structure, we have thing we have um, things such as status set, ascribed status, achieved status, and sal salient status, and master status. Your status set is your full range of statuses. So you you're a mother, you're a wife, you're a daughter, you're a teacher. Ascribed status is that status that you're not able to change. For example, male or female. Achieved status is what you've earned during the course of your life. So you've studied, you've studied hard and now you're a nurse. That's your achieved status. Um, your master status is your overarching status. The status that defines who you are. So if we take a look at President Obama. President Obama is a father. He is a son. He is a husband. He is a cousin, an uncle. But when we think of him, we think of none of those. When we think of him, we think of the president. 
And so the president becomes his overarching, his, his master status or his overarching status. And finally, the salient status is that status which dominates who we are at that time. Right now, you may be uh, your, your, your mother, your daughter, your sister. But as you watch this video right now, you're watching it as a student. And that is your salient status at this moment. Every status has a role. And as we think of roles, role is um, how roles exist in relation to each other. So we have role strain, we have role conflict, and we have role exit. Role strain is when a role is so demanding that we cannot handle it and so we break down beneath the, beneath the strain of that role. Role conflict is when two roles together cannot coexist. For example, I cannot be a mother and a teacher at the same time. In order to be, I have to put, in order to be a teacher, I have to put the mothering behind me and come to you as a teacher, not as a mother. When I'm with my kids, I can't be a professor with my kids. I can't be DR or Dr. Morrison with my kids. I'm mommy. So there are times that you literally have to, um, literally when two roles, um, come together they become incompatible and then we have role exit which is where you leave one role you disengage from one role and um, you engage in another role now we have institutions in society that helps to prepare us to live in society help to prepare us to be social beings what are these institutions namely the family economic institutions or military, academic institutions, religious institutions, and science and technology. Our family is, um, is where we're introduced to socialization. Our economic institutions make sure that our society um, is economically viable. Our military institution protects us both nationally and internationally. Then we have education and education prepares us to function both as a member of society and more importantly as a valued member of society. Our religious belief regardless of what religion we, we are tend to um, set us up in terms of our morals, tend to gauge for us our morals. And finally, our science and technology allows us to experience interventions and to move from one phase of living to the next. Thank you, guys. I know this was a long lecture, but um, I hope that it was good for you. Thank you and have a wonderful day.